Greetings from the Jazz Cloud, Richie Zellen here, welcoming you to the Jazz Guitar Channel. On February 2nd, 2022, I was saddened to hear that we lost a great jazz guitar pioneer, Joe Diorio. And so I'd like to dedicate this lesson to his memory and share with you a sample of his unique contribution to the ongoing evolution of jazz guitar. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you are not familiar with his music. And that is because, sad to say, Joe was a musician deserving much, much wider recognition. It is sad that most of his recordings were either self-produced or recorded on very obscure, low-budget labels, and they were always very hard to find. And it's hard to understand why a player of this caliber who was admired by such respected musicians as, for instance, Pat Metheny and jazz critics such as Leonard Feather never got produced by one of the many established jazz labels that existed back in the CD era. Either way, his music lives on and hopefully his name and music will rise to that legendary status that sometimes only happens after an artist dies. But enough of the sad talk. In this lesson, I want to share with you a couple of transcriptions that display two concepts that when applied to the guitar, Joe Diorio is credited as being one of the main pioneers. And I am referring to the use of quartal harmony, both when improvising and comping, as well as when playing outside the changes. When I first heard Joe Diorio back in the late 70s, my initial impression was this guy is doing for the first time on guitar what John Coltrane and McCoy Tyner were doing on their respective instruments. And if you're familiar with their music, I'm sure you'll agree. So on that note, let me play you the first of two transcriptions. This first one is based on an exercise from Joe's book, Structures from the New Millennium and it's a major 2-5-1. This is a splendid example of a line based on quartal harmony without any outside notes. That is, everything is diatonic in relation to the prescribed chords. If you analyze it intervallically, you'll note that it uses primarily fourths and seconds as well as their inversions. And remember, a fourth inverts to a fifth and a second inverts to a seventh and vice versa. So, as a result, the use of frequent wide interval leaps is inherent in this style. And let me add that thirds are avoided for the most part in quartal harmony. In the first measure here, we have two consecutive thirds only in the second set of 16th notes and then in the second measure. Again, a third between the last 16th of the third beat and the first one of the fourth beat. So, keep this in mind. If you like this sound, try to imply the harmony by creating lines that avoid the use of thirds or sixths between the notes. Next, I'm going to play for you a transcription I did especially for this lesson, which not only displays Joe's use of quartal harmony, but also how he played outside the changes. This, by the way, is very reminiscent of pianist McCoy Tyner. And if you want some more info on McCoy's style as applied to the guitar, please check out the tribute lesson I did for him. I'll place a link in the info section down below. I transcribed eight measures of Joe's solo off his recording of Autumn Leaves from his live duet album with Ricardo del Fra, titled Double Take. Since this is very hard to find, I am going to let you hear this excerpt. As played by Joe and immediately after that, You'll hear me play it slower while displaying the notation.
In the first measure, we see that the A minor 7, or 2 minor chord, has no 3rd or 7th. That is, no guide tones that imply that it's a minor chord. It's intentionally very hybrid, but we could say that it's really loosely functioning as an A sus4 chord. Notice that there are no intervals of a third. Notice the wide interval leaps, especially the minor seventh between the third and fourth notes. There is also lots of superimposition of outside harmony here. If you look at the last two notes of measure one and the first two notes of measure two, you'll see that he is thinking over the tritone of A minor. But he's not thinking over a dominant, but instead another minor chord, in this case, E flat minor. It is convenient because it resolves by half step down to the actual D7 altered, which he actually plays over for beats two, three, and four of the second measure. In the third measure, we see that instead of playing over the one major seven, he is again thinking over a sus4 chord as he did over the initial measure. So he is again making it a hybrid, no third or seventh, and he's doing this by turning it into a G sus4. Now notice how he side slips to an A flat minor starting on the last two notes of this third measure and extends it through the first half of the fourth measure. He then returns to the G root, but this time implies a G minor. Now, there is one more interesting concept that I want to point out here. Notice how the contour of measures 3 and 4 are almost identical to that of measures 1 and 2. In other words, look at the shape or outline of the note heads in measures 3 and 4, and you'll notice that it is the same rising and descending pitch outline as that of measures 1 and 2. This reveals Diorio's thinking in intervallic patterns and how he transposed them to different sets of pitch levels. And I think this is genius because in the midst of that harmonic tension, he is creating a homogeneous musical statement that actually tells a story. In the fifth measure, we would normally play over an F minor 7 flat 5, but again, Diorio is superimposing a B sus4 chord like he did in measures 1 and 3. So this is very interesting because he has superimposed sus4 chords on every other measure. In other words, A sus4 to G sus4 to B sus4. Now, in the sixth measure here, instead of playing over the B7 flat 9, he is implying an A flat 7 mixolydian. On second thought, he might be thinking of it as an E flat minor 7, which is a Dorian relative of A flat 7. As most of you know, all the notes in A flat mixolydian are diatonic to those of E flat Dorian. If this is the case, he would simply be approaching the final E minor 7 chord from a half step below, which makes more sense. Here we have the final two measures of this transcription, and after taking it outside throughout most of the progression, he is finally bringing it back inside to end the cadence by playing strictly over the prescribed E minor 7. This adds a sense of final resolution to all the tension that preceded it. It's like he's saying, we can rest now. We are home. <laughs> In the first measure here, he is clearly implying an E minor 6-9 arpeggio, which in the second measure turns into just a, a plain E minor 7. I know this stuff is way over most players' heads, but if you can wrap your head around it and appreciate what's going on, it's really good stuff. So for those of you who are still with me, is anyone out there? <laughs> I really am curious to know what you think. If by any chance there are any former students of Joe watching this video, please share with us your experience and any anecdotes you may have. I say this because I know that in addition to teaching at the University of Miami back in the 70s, Joe later spent some time teaching at GIT in LA. Well, I hope you dug this lesson, and as usual, I appreciate your likes, comments, and welcome your questions. And if this is your first time on the Jazz Guitar Channel, please be sure to subscribe. Until we meet again, practice, practice, practice. Stay safe, and may peace.
peace be with you. Hasta la vista.